Hello, everyone, and welcome to Schwab Coaching. My name is Cameron May, and this is Getting Started with Technical Analysis. And today, we're talking about a tool that can only be found on Thinkorswim. Yep, it's a Thinkorswim exclusive. It's known as the Market Forecast Indicator, and we're going to be using it to plan and place short-term stock trades. Should be a really good discussion. Uh, before we can get into any of that, though, let me first of all say hello to everybody that's chatting. Hello there, Wes and Chris, Scott, Kim, Krishna, BJ, Susan, Wiley, Robert, Randy, and everybody else. Thanks for joining us week after week. If you're here for the very first time, I want to welcome you as well. And if you're watching on the YouTube archive after the fact, enjoy the presentation. Be aware that you're invited to join us in the live discussion. It does kick off promptly 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time on, uh, on Tuesday afternoons. What are we now? The, the holidays thrown me off. Anyway, yes. Tuesday afternoons. But in any case, I'm also joined in the live chat by my very good friend, Lee Bowl. He's going to be answering any questions that I can't get to just during the natural flow of the presentation. Thanks for being there, Lee. But let's get right into this. Very first thing that we need to do, of course, is to pause to consider the risks associated with investing, including, including technical trading. So uh, do bear this in mind. Um, the paper money application is for educational purposes only. We will be using that paper money platform, but having success there is not a guarantee that we're going to have success with our real funds as market conditions do change. They can change rapidly. Any investment decision you make in your self-directed account is solely your responsibility. The information here is for general informational purposes only and should not be considered an individualized recommendation or, endorse, uh, or endorsement of any particular security, chart pattern, or investment strategy. Schwab does not recommend the use of technical analysis as a sole means of investment research. And investing involves risks, including a loss of principal. All right. So with that said, let's set the agenda for the day. Now, what I'd like to do is we start to talk about this indicator, this thinkorswim indicator known as the market forecast. I'd like for you to chat in. Let me know, are you familiar with the market forecast indicator? You know, whether you've used it in paper money or real money or maybe just, a, just acquainted with it uh, theoretically. Are you familiar with it? I would suspect that a broad swath of our audience today, both live and those watching the archive after the fact, are not going to be terribly familiar with this indicator. So first item on the agenda is to introduce the basic construction of the indicator. Okay, We're not going to go deeply into the algorithms that build it, but I just want to go through the, the basic elements of its construction. Then we're going to talk about how it might be applied in the potential recognition of short-term entry signals on a stock. Now, to set the stage, we're gonna start with the S&P 500 and apply it there. And you might think that something called a market forecast must be used for forecasting the market, right? Well, not always. It actually can be used in the planning of a short-term stock trade. Yeah, it could also be long-term, but short-term is gonna be the focus here. So construction, application, then we're gonna get some repetition. We're gonna look at several different, different uh, charts until we're just about sick of recognizing the, the signals that might be generated using this indicator. And then we're actually gonna plan and place an example stock trade, start to finish, okay? So there's our agenda for the day. Let me see what the feedback has been here in our chats. Jonathan, no, you're not familiar with this one. Hel Helen and Michael say yes, and Chris B says yes. Wiley doesn't, doesn't surprise me. Wiley's been watching my stuff for a long time. But Gene and Susan, this is gonna be new to them, and I think for hundreds of other people. So. Let's make sure that we go at a pace that everybody can follow. Let's go over to the Thinkorswim platform and talk, first of all, about the construction of the uh, market forecast tool. So to add this to our example chart, we're going to pop up here to the little uh, studies beaker icon or flask icon. So I'm going to click on that edit studies icon. And here are the hundreds of technical indicators. That are, that are to be found on the Thinkorswim platform. And by the way, we're going to be exploring a number of these in this webcast series. So make sure that you put it in your calendar to come back on Tuesdays if you want to join the live presentation or to just check out the archive on our Trader Talks channel. Make sure you subscribe to that channel so you can find those archives. But in any case, this one's called the Market Forecast. Just run it all together as we type this in. So we're going to type in Market Forecast. There it is. We could have just gone down in alphabetical order down through the list of potential studies and found it that way. But I'm going to add that to our chart. Now, as I click apply, what you're going to see here is a series of lines down below. OK, now I'm going to leave that partially obscured for the moment because I want to customize those just a little bit, just so that you can see this, I think, a little bit more readily. 
I'm going to come to a little gear icon here on our edit studies and strategies pop up window, click on that little gear. And this is going to allow me to change the thickness of the lines. Now there are three lines in the construction of this indicator. So I'm going to change the thickness of all three. There's one that's called the momentum line, and you're going to see it displayed as red on our chart. Right now it's width is set to one. I'm just going to dial that up to two. We also have the near term line. You're going to see that displayed as a blue line on the chart. You can see it right over here. Let's change that to a two in thickness from scale of one to five. Our intermediate line, that's our green line. Let's click on that. I don't want to change the plot color. I want to change the width. Let's dial that one up to a three. And there's logic in doing that. I'll explain that. Okay. Now you don't have to do this at home. This is purely for my purposes as a presenter. The indicator works just fine the way it is without these customizations if you're not presenting it to a thousand other people. Okay. But I'm going to click OK and then click Apply. And what we're left with now is this mess of twisted lines running back and forth, up and down on a scale. Okay. Now, the other thing is, and this is kind of cheating on my part, there's this red, uh, pardon me, this blue dashed line, the horizontal line right here. That's just a drawing. I'm just going to take that off. Right click, remove that drawing. This is what our market forecast tool looks like. Okay. So, yeah, we already know this is now, it now consists of three colored lines. We have the red, and you can, you can uh, remember these if you, if you want to remember them, there's no reason to remember the, the names necessarily. But we have our red uh, momentum line, our blue near term line, and then our green intermediate line. I'm probably just going to call them red, blue, and green through the rest of this presentation. The titles are interesting. But um, what are these lines? Well, I'm not going to go, as I mentioned, I'm not going to go deeply into the algorithms that generate that line, those lines. I think it would just take us too far off track and spend too much of our precious uh, learning time here. But basically, these are similar to, if you're familiar with stochastics, they're just oscillating lines that move back and forth, and they're intended to measure relatively short-term price momentum. So these are, if you think of it this way, three stochastic lines. Or even failing that, just think of them as measurements of momentum, price momentum in different time frames. So the first one is our red line. And if you look at that, just focus your attention on that red line for just a moment. You'll notice that it changes direction very quickly. It might go up for a day or two and then reverse and go down for a day or two. Quick reversals. Okay. And it's uh, contained within a scale. On the low end, it can't go below zero. And on the high end, it can't go above 100. All three of the lines are contained within that same scale. But this is really just indicated, uh, pardon me, it's just, it's just uh, intended to show us an indication of very short-term price momentum. Is that serviceable for today's discussion to explain what that red line is? I think that'll work. The blue line, our blue, okay, near-term line, is just a little bit longer indication of price momentum. So you'll notice it'll go up for a day or two or three, maybe four, a little bit longer term, and then reverse and come back down. So instead of lows, uh, they're unlike the red being separated by a day or two or three, the lows on the blue are typically going to be separated by mm, maybe a week. Okay. Cyclical lows to cyclical highs taking a little bit longer, a little bit longer reversals of momentum being represented here. And then finally, we have our green intermediate line. It is the slowest change in momentum. It's still a momentum indicator, still an oscillator, much like a stochastic, but it'll tend to travel downward for days to weeks before finally hitting a low and reversing that momentum to starting to come back up again, okay? So those are our three lines. Important elements here, three lines, different time frames all ranging between zero and 100, and all behaving to indicate different levels of momentum, okay? Now, the final thing is, for those of you who, oh, by the way, Sabrina just asked a great question. Thanks for asking it, Sabrina, because I've, I've covered this in previous webcasts, but not everybody's seen all those previous webcasts. Sabrina says, a very basic question, this simulated trading platform is available on Schwab, Please post a link to it. So, Sabrina, it's it's available for download from Schwab. 
It's actually software that can be downloaded to your computer. It doesn't cost anything. It's available to anybody with a Schwab account, and you just find it on the trade tab. Yeah, it's called Thinkorswim, so you'd look for it there. You can also download it at thinkorswim.com, okay? But it just creates a little icon on your computer's desktop that looks like a little starburst, like the one you're seeing down here at the bottom of my screen. And you just log in and using your, your Schwab username and password, and then you have access to, every, to this uh, slate of tools that you're seeing me use. Now, yes, one other thing I want to point out is it does say simulated trading, but you can also live into real accounts and trade and manage real positions. So there, it'll ask you whether you want to do paper trading or real trading as you're logging in. So just make sure you're selecting the one that you intend. All right, so back to our indicator, much like a stochastic oscillator, our little momentum lines uh, will sometimes achieve what we call an overbought condition, and sometimes they'll achieve what we call an oversold condition. So if you can imagine, with if you're not familiar with stochastic, it's a line just like one of these three, that when it rises up, gets closer to 100, when it gets above 80, it's considered to, buy, to be by some in an overbought condition. It means maybe in the short term, prices might be a little bit top heavy. Uh, to the opposite extent, if our oscillator has moved down and if it's below 20, it might be considered to be oversold. It might be an indication that prices are hitting short-term lows. That's it's not always guaranteed that that's gonna work out that way, but that's a common interpretation. So just for convenience purposes, I'm gonna add a line here to represent the oversold. That's being below 20 on our zero to 100 range. So I'm gonna come over here to our little active tool, click on that and select our trend line tool. And let's just draw in a line as close as we can get it to 20. So if you look over here, you're gonna see as I move my cursor up and down, there's a value that's following me. Let's, let's just draw a line right close to 20, right there. Okay, I'm gonna bring it over here and we'll click on 20 again. There we go. And now we have that line there. So now that we know the way to go says, is it similar to RSI? Yes, it actually is quite similar, but also significantly different from RSI. It's also similar to MACD. It's similar to stochastic. It's similar to CCI. So many other indicators that are designed to oscillate up and down in an effort to measure short-term momentum. Yeah. So is my purpose today to tell everybody that because this is an exclusive on Thinkorswim that it's better than all the rest? Nope. Each oscillator and indicator has its own potential strengths and also their potential shortcomings, and none of them are guaranteed to perform on any given trade, right? Yeah, Chris B says probably closer to stochastic. Yep, yep, I'd agree with that. But it's still in that category of oscillating indicators. So RSI, a fair comparison, okay? But what I wanna talk about now, we're shifting gears now from how it's constructed to how it might, might be used. Now. There's a specific signal that, that uh, some traders of the market forecast will look for that's actually pretty uncommon. It's actually, it's, it's interesting because it's, in my experience, the most common signal that's used, but it doesn't happen very commonly. It's, very, it's, a, it's a comparatively rare set of events. So here is what we're looking for. What the trader is looking for as all three lines are moving up and down and up and down kind of madly, they're looking for all three lines to reach down below 20 on the same day. So think about what that might imply. If all three lines are down here below 20 on the same day, for example, back here, all three lines, can you see that? Maybe if I zoom in, it'll be a little bit more clear. On Thinkorswim, if you just click and drag on your chart, it's gonna highlight a period, a section of the chart, and then it'll zoom in on that section. So as I release my click, it's gonna zoom in on just that period. So here we are looking back in March, and you'll see right around March 13th, all three of our lines ducked below 20 at the same time. So think about the technical implications there. We have three different time frames of price momentum all appearing to be in the oversold condition on the same day. Well, if something has gone down just about as far as it can go, what does that leave for where price can go from here? Well, conceptually, price should go up. Does that mean that it's certainly gonna go up? Nope. No, there are times when, this, when these signals fail. But yeah, to a technician, when they see all three of these lines drop below 20 on the same date or at the same time, 
that can be a signal that maybe price is reaching toward a bottom and maybe it's setting up to reverse from there. So we actually have a name for this. What do we refer to, what, what do we call this? Those of you who use the market forecast tool, you probably know that there's a name for this. All three lines, all three oscillating lines going below 20 into the oversold area at the same time. That's known as a cluster. Yep, they're all clustering together down below 20. And to a trader who's looking for a bullish entry, that may be just what they're looking for. Speak truth, you can call it, give it a different name, like a bottom bounce, sure, yep, yep. But the technical term here is cluster, right? So for some, that in itself is an actionable scenario. Just, yeah, Vincent, exactly. It's a cluster. If we get a cluster below 20, for some, they, they may actually enter into a trade immediately. Now, this is the SPX. So the interpretation here might not necessarily be time to place a specific trade. It might just mean, oh, maybe the markets are bottoming. And maybe that might lead to all sorts of trade uh, potentials for, for bullish entry as we go look at individual stocks. But now for others, though, it's not the mere appearance. And this is probably more common. I will say it's not the mere appearance of a cluster where all three lines go down below 20 at the same time that signals entry, but it's actually when this green intermediate line starts to turn back up. Okay. So it, if you'll notice, um, we can actually confirm that green. I can, I can eyeball this and I can see from the 13th of March to the 14th of March, there is the slightest up tilt to that green intermediate line. Meaning that that of the three, the longest indication of momentum is starting to go up as well. Okay. But it can be kind of hard to spot. Is that going up or is it really just going sideways? Well, we go sideways. Well, we can actually check this numerically. If we look over here in the in the upper left corner, you can see that there are values for each of these lines as i move around it change it shows us the precise value along our scale here so if i point over here i can see on uh, on january 25th uh, the the red line was at 47 the blue line was at 79 and the green intermediate line was at 65. so if i go back here to the 13th i can see green line was at 13 well let's let's be more precise 13.1 on the 14th, it moved to 14.46. I can see that that went up a, a point and some change. This is definitely changing direction, starting to go higher. And so for that technician who's waiting for the green intermediate line to start to rise, their entry signal may actually be on the 14th here. It'll be that day. Let's maybe make a little hash mark to show that. It's right here as we started that up tilt. Does that make sense? Speak Truth says, how much weight will one put on the candle slash candle pattern during a cluster? A technician is always free to bring whatever, and it's a great question, but a technician is always free to bring in whatever um, other elements of the chart that they consider to be important. This may just be one additional tool. It may not be a tool for everybody. I'm not here to tell everybody that they should be using this tool. I just, I just explain how it works. And just like every other indicator, it's up to you to decide, is this, is this even going to play a role in, in the management of my portfolio? Maybe or maybe not. Okay. Ahmed says, how do you uh, set it up? Fortunately, you don't have to do anything to set it up, Ahmed. You just have to choose it from the menu right here. Market forecast, choose it, click on apply, click OK, and you're done. Okay. And you can, if anybody misses anything in these webcasts, the nice thing is you can just go back to the archive and watch it again. All right. Jonathan says, maybe a crossover popping up out of the, the oversold area. In other words, this green intermediate line rising up. Could that be the confirmation the trader is waiting for? I've definitely heard of that as well. Yeah. For the purposes of today's discussion, we're going to look at the appearance of a cluster as sort of like, let's say we're in our drag racing car and we're sitting there at, uh, at the start of the race. This may be, for the purposes of today's discussion, the, the signal to start your engines, okay? When the green intermediate line turns up, that's the punch the gas. 
that's the green light. The little, the little light tree that starts at drag race, that's, that means our green light has appeared, okay? <clears throat> now, that is not, and Ahmed, you're asking a good question. You might need to go back and watch the first 20 minutes of this presentation again on the archive, okay? But um, yeah, there's our entry signal, cluster, and then an up tilt in that green intermediate line. Yes, we could wait for a break above 20. That's not necessarily the one that we're talking about today, but it is a variation on this, on basically the same theme, okay? All right, so let's start to get some repetition with this. If we now know how to recognize a cluster, what's, a, what's an efficient way to spot these things? Because if we zoom back out again, you might say, Cameron, well, your eyes are trained to spot these things. I look at this and it's a big cluttered mess. How do I zero in? Well, one, one function that can really be helpful is to just train one's eyes to look at what the green intermediate line is doing. Because if it's up here, it can't generate a cluster. Meanwhile, we have the red line and the blue line are zipping back and forth. If your eyes are looking at those, it might look like um, a possible cluster at any time. But nope, we need that green line to get down below 20. And then we can look to see if the, uh, if the red and blue line happen to be there at the same time. So here's an example of where some traders, let's look at August 17th, or August, uh, yeah, let's look at the 17th and the 18th. Matter of fact, oh, and by the way, looking back here, did that do a pretty decent job of anticipating a reversal point for the S&P 500? It did in this case, doesn't always, no, no indicator is perfect, but this example seems like it worked out pretty well. What about this right here? Price rallied from this possible cluster, <clears throat> but I'm gonna tell you why I don't think it was actually a cluster. And that is because as our green intermediate line was going down to get below 20, our red and our blue lines were actually already rising up above. So if we hover over August 18th and we look over here, Let's look at our numbers again. Let me go back here. And again, maybe if I zoom in, it's gonna be a little bit easier to see. Let's zoom in on this period. So what was I looking at? Oh, it was right there, okay. I'm gonna hover over August 18th, and you tell me where were the three lines exactly? Well, the red line, 23.96, it's not below 20. The blue line, oh, let me get back there was at 17.4, the green line was at 19.5. So two of the three are below, but this might be considered by some who are really finicky about their signals to be a near miss. What about the day before? What about the 17th? Well, that one, the red line was at 4.4, that's a check. The blue line was at 2.9, that's a check. Green line was at 25. So we got close, but on no individual single day were all three lines below 20 on the same date. So now there are gonna be some that might just look at this visually and they say, you know what, close enough. And it, that might be absolutely serviceable, okay? Others though are sticklers. They need all three lines below 20 on the same date. So this close, but no cigar. What about here? Nope, not all below 20. What about here? Nope, not all below 20. What about here? What about October 26th? Yep, I'm gonna put a blue oval around that. On October 26th, our red lines and our blue lines both dropped below 20 to join the green intermediate line. And that um, did give us a cluster. So what are we thinking at that time? Is it Punch the gas, for some, they might wait for an uptick in that green intermediate line, which actually came the next day. So in this case, it looks like the signal was here. Are you following that? I know we, we kind of splitting hairs here. Let me zoom in a little bit more so you can see this. So here, all three lines are below 20 but it's not until the next day when the green line starts the uptick. I can confirm that using the numbers. We went from 6.6 .6 to 6.8. So we got our uptick right there. There's our entry signal if this were an individual stock, or it might just be a signal that the S&P 500 
is hitting a low. And in this case, it did a pretty fair job again. Now, having said that, we've, we've just looked at two examples, both of which looks like they panned out pretty well. As a matter of fact, if you were trying to catch, trying to call the sort of the, the very best bottoms of the year, those coincided with two very nice um, bullish uh, cluster confirmations. But notice there were only two this year. Is this a signal that pops up all the time? Is it going to be something that shows up every day of the week? Nope. This is something that's, that one might have to have some patience for on individual stocks. But if one is following a sufficient number of stocks, if we're looking at 50 stocks, even if each one is only generating two signals a year, that's still 100 signals a year. So there's still plenty of activity for that uh, for that investor who uses this sort of a technical device in the planning of their trade. Okay, so now let's sort of flip the switch. Let's go look at individual stocks and get some examples here. Now that we know what, what a cluster looks like and how to recognize a, a confirmed signal with that rising intermediate line, let's just start going through the S&P 500 and look at history and see when these have generated signals and how they performed. And then also start to plan how to take, the, how to manage the back end of the trade, okay? So let's go over here to our left column. I'm gonna to go to our watch list. And what I've done here, Thinkorswim actually publishes a watch list of the S&P 500 component companies. So these are, yeah, those big companies that make up the S&P. And I've just organized those from top to bottom in order of size, market condition, or, or market, market capitalization. And yes, Microsoft has actually leapfrogged Apple in being the biggest company in the world, okay? Yep, there's Microsoft up there at the top, just a little bit higher, a little bit bigger than, um, than Apple. Oda says, how now can we scan using market forecast? I think that might require a script, Oda. I'd have to go dig and see. Uh, however, I think it also might be just as quick to just look through a watch list that one might already be interested in, okay? So I'm gonna come over here to the S&P. Now this is, by the way, this is not saying the S&P is the only place to do this. I've just used that. They're big, you know, more liquid stocks than average. So let's start at the top, go to Microsoft. This is one that we already have a position in, but just eyeballing it, how many cluster signals do you think there have been in 2023, 2024 on Microsoft? Not very many. Let's draw in our line for quick visual reference. We don't have to draw in the lines. I'm just gonna do it so that everybody can sort of follow along. Where's 20? It's about right here, okay? How many times has the green intermediate line even been below 20 in the last 12 months? Twice. So really just a couple of opportunities for a possible signal. Let's see, let's zoom in on this one. And it looks like, did we get all three below zero right here on the same day? Yup, we did. Right there. There's our cluster. But the intermediate line continued going down. It looks to me like we got an uptick right here. We went from 5.24 to 5. Point, nope, 1.9. It's still going down. 5.19 to 5.66. So it was actually on August 10th that we got a trade confirmation. This is an example of how it doesn't, does it always nail the absolute bottom of every move? Of course it doesn't. No indicator is perfect, but right here appears to be a signal. So for a trader, they might say, oh, okay, so right there, maybe price is set to start to rise again. And it didn't, it actually went down for a couple, for, oh, we'll call it about another week. Interestingly, what did we get again right there? There's a, there's a second cluster with a confirmation the next day. There was actually a cluster confirmation on this day. So we have one signal that was not perfect. And then this one actually did a pretty fair job of nailing it. So here are our two signals. Let's see, there's one right, one right there, one right there, okay? Now, if we are waiting there was the proposal earlier to wait for, for the intermediate line to rise. That looks like that came about right here. In any case, you tell me, after the cluster events, did the stock have more upside 
or more downside? Seem to be more upside here, right? All right, let's move on to actually, did we get another cluster after this? I don't think so. This looks like the intermediate line went down all by itself. Let's zoom in. Yep, by the time this got below 20, the blue was already above 80. Nope, there, was, there were just those two signals on uh, Microsoft. Let's go to Apple. Oh, looks pretty similar. Let's zoom in. You know that we're looking for 20 and 80 now. Did we get below 20 on all three here? Nope, the blue line was at 21. I'm looking at the numbers. Did we get below 20 on all three here? Yes. Speak Truth says, Cam, market forecast seems viable as an entry signal, right? You know, again, this I'm, I'm teaching the example entry. It's viability is going gonna, is gonna to vary from one trade example to the next, right? But um, how do we plan the exits? Yep, that's actually going to be done not using the market forecast tool. Market forecast tool is really for entries. There, there are some traders who, who use it for interpreting exit signals, not for today's discussion, though. Okay, but it looks like for Apple, we did get a, a cluster right here. Confirmation the next day, that uh, gave a signal right here. And price looks like it performed pretty well in the uh, weeks. And really after that, just maybe one or two days that stretched a little bit lower. Did we get another signal here? Yep, there was another cluster right there and a follow through right here. So I think, are you getting a little bit better at spotting these clusters? You getting comfortable with the recognition of those signals? Let's zoom back out again and see how this is doing in identifying potential bottoms. Um, I don't think there's been anything recent on Alphabet. Oh, there was a cluster. Was there a cluster right there? There was, yep. There was a cluster right here with an uptick right here on Apple. So a recent confirmation would be right in this range. So we'll see. We'll see if Apple can hold, it, can hold this. I don't think so on Alphabet. I don't think I saw a confirmed cluster. Was there one here? No. Nope, on no day did we get all three below, not here. Nope, nothing on Alphabet. On Amazon, there's a cluster right there. Are your eyes starting to pick up on these even without looking at the numbers? You can just glance and see when the intermediate line reaches an extreme, that might be a time to start looking for clusters. So if we have a, a cluster there and a confirmation, that looks like that happened around here. Not bad. And not here, not here. Was there one here? Yep. Let's zoom in a little bit. All three lines right there on October 26th. That's a cluster. Confirmation the next day was a signal right here. Zooming back out, how did that do? All right, so I think we've, we've kind of beaten this thing up. We now know how to recognize clusters. We know the filters that some might apply to look for confirmation. Has there been one even on a single one on NVIDIA? Looks like the only one all year. I don't think there was one here on NVIDIA. It looks like, yeah, the only cluster all year on NVIDIA was right here. Right there. So is this a signal that pops up all the time on an individual stock? Nope, you might have to have some patience. If we only have one tradable stock out there, we might have to wait six months or a year before we get an individual signal. And maybe that signal works out, maybe it doesn't. But if we're monitoring a series of stocks, we're getting a series of signals and that can fill in the gaps. You know, versus, you know, between maybe the trader's favored stock, there might be signals on others. But, so let's go back to the question, Speak Truth asks the question, is there an exit signal? This is where the trader can bring in a little bit more of their, um, of their understanding of technical analysis, a common application for um, the planning of an exit with a with the market uh, forecast cluster here is to exit at a previous peak, at the peak just before we got the signal. 
Because in order for all three momentum lines to be coming down, what does price pretty much have to be doing? It's gotta be coming down. So a trader may look, when has this downward motion ended and where might we take profits if, we, if the momentum really does shift upward? So they may look back to the previous peak. And in this case for Nvidia, since we're here, we may look at that peak right here and that may have been a planned exit to harvest potential gains on if we if we were trading this uh, trade. Okay, let's go back and look at our other examples. So with um, with Amazon, if we were getting in after this pullback, yep, we might look to get out at this peak. If there are multiple peaks, a trader may even layer out, scale out, take half off at the first peak, take the rest off at the next peak and so on. Let's get some more repetition and go back to Apple. So with Apple, where might we plan to take profits? Well, a recent peak looks like it was back here. And on this signal, a recent peak was back here. Now in both cases, this one took some patience, right? There may actually, might've actually needed to, to wait before we ultimately got up to that peak. And maybe in the first case, we might've even gotten stopped out. Let's see, let's look at Microsoft. Yeah, here's um, another example. Here's our low, here's a previous peak. Did we go there immediately? Nope. Were there some scary moments where the trade wasn't looking quite so good between there and actually hitting that peak? Looked like it, in this case, it might've taken a few months. Still, I think within the realm of quote unquote short-term trading, but uh, yeah, that's a, that's a potential way to, to plan things. now. A variation on this theme is if we're in a downtrend, traders may actually not expect to get back up to previous peaks. They might actually be looking to just get up to the trend line. In that case, in this one, might have already been at the trend line at the moment of the signal. All right. But um, what about the other side of the trade? What about if, if the signal fails? Now, in these initial examples that we've been looking at, it looks like most of them have done fairly well. And that could be a condition of just how cooperative the markets have been for the bulls for most of the last 12 months, right? Some of these are not going to work out. So if we're getting in because we've seen a signal where we think there's going to be a bottom and then the bottom falls out, maybe it's time to get out of that trade. So a common exit strategy for the planning, the downside of that trade is to look at the low of the signal and go, you know, a dollar or two, maybe two or three percentage points below that. Okay. It can vary based on the value of the stock and the, and the volatility of the stock. But for some traders, they might go, you know, one to 3% below. Others might go one to $3 below. But in any case with Amazon, did we get below that here? Nope, in that case, we went up. If we flash back over here to Apple, if we were a few percentage points below this low, and I don't think we ever got more than a, maybe 2% below. Certainly not in this case, it just barely snuck below. But here the trader is just looking to, um, to hopefully assist in the reward potential, the upside, compared to the risk potential or the downside. Okay, how about we look now at one more trade, uh, one more scenario. What about Tesla? Now, Helen is saying, Cam, how about adjusting the stop on Microsoft? Could, could there be other rules um, introduced for when to adjust things up? It could be, right? There are just an infinite number of variations that one can take uh, on, a, on a given trading system and start to tweak and refine that to fit one's own preferences. So uh, Helen, what I'll say is, could that be done? It certainly could be done. Are we gonna do it, be doing it today? Nope, not today, okay? But here's Tesla. How has Tesla done over the course of the last uh, year? We, we pretty much got down to that. I think we didn't look at Meta because I don't think it even had a cluster. It hasn't had a cluster in the last 12 months. I can just see that. So going on to Tesla, it's had a few clusters. There's one here. I think you can see a cluster here. And that looks like price was here. 
we had a cluster here. Price was here. We had a cluster right here. Price was here. So has it been doing a fairly decent job in, this, in these examples of identifying possible reversal points in price? With all three of our momentum oscillators bottoming out at the same time and starting to rise, yep, in this case, it seems like it's been working out fairly well. What do we have right now? Well, if we look closely, I think just, was it just, yeah, it was just on Friday. On Friday, all three lines, the, the uh, red line was at eight, blue line was 11, green line's at 15, all below 20 at the same time. Now, green line's still going down. And I could, I could say, well, let's just sit around and wait for the green line to go up. Eventually, it should go up. I can never guarantee anything in the future, but yeah, it should go up um, in, the, in the next few days. We don't have the luxury of waiting. So if you'll forgive me, let's just say that we got that upturn in our green line, okay? Where might we plan to take profits? If we enter a trade today on the evidence of a cluster, where might we take profits? Well, a recent high was right up here. And as a matter of fact, it coincides with a previous high. So there's an old resistance right up there. Let's call that our planned profit taking level. That looks like that's right around 265, okay? Where might we take our losses? Well, we don't have the confirmation yet, but let's assume that we had that green intermediate line confirmation. We might go two or three percentage points below today's low. What's today's low? Well, I can point at today's candle and look up here at the L that stands for low. It looks like our low is about 212. 3% below that is gonna be about six bucks. So maybe our uh, a planned exit around 206, okay? So there we go. Let's say, I don't intend to draw another line here. That was just a mistake. Let's just remove that line. So let's take a trade here where our plan is to buy right now around 220, take profits up at 265, take losses down at 206 if they, if they happen, or around 206. We never know. With a stop, it's not a guarantee. About a $14 risk for maybe a $45 reward, pretty close to a three to one reward to risk scenario. CL asks another great question. Can this indicator be used intraday, shorter term? Yeah, conceptually with technical analysis, so many concepts can be used on shorter term and longer term timeframes. Yep. Uh, but yes, this is one of those, but let's go to our trade tab. And again, whatever the time frame, it might work, it might not, right? There's always that possibility of, of failure. So we plan for that. But let's go to Tesla. And let's right click on the trade tab. We go to the ask price and right click, and we're gonna put in a custom buy order. So we're gonna buy some shares. Our custom buy order is gonna be with an OCO bracket, which is gonna have the, the buy order plus two sell orders. So an OCO bracket, if you're not familiar with this, let's close up this left column so that we can see our order field more completely. An OCO bracket means I wanna buy, but then if, then I, I want two sell orders, one to take profits if we get there, one to take losses if we get there. But I only want one of those to fill. Profit, if we hit profits, great, out, and we want to cancel the other order. If we have to take our losses, oops, out, and we want to cancel the, other, the, this, the order to sell to take profits. So one cancels the other. Okay, so here's our buy order. Let's say for today's example, um, we have a hundred thousand dollar portfolio. Let's say that we're willing to spend ten thousand bucks. You know, one share would be two hundred bucks, or two hundred ish. Let's say that we're willing to uh, buy fifty shares. It's going to be a little bit more than ten thousand dollars. Let's click the broken chain link and tie those orders together so that the buy order matches the sell orders. You can see that those automatically changed. I'm going to put this as, an, as a market order to buy which carries risks, right? We, not, we might not know exactly what we pay. But the limit order is to take our profits. Let's put that in at 265. That was if we get up to that previous high. I'm going to make that a good till cancel. We're just saying, hey, 265 is my limit. I don't want to spend, I don't want to 
sell for a penny less. Our stop order is to stop the bleeding. Where do we decide on that one? At 206, I think, 3% below our low of 212. Let's make that a good till canceled order. And there we have it. Now let's click confirm and send. We're gonna buy 50 shares of Tesla at the current market price, whatever that happens to be at the time our order gets to the front of the line. Then we're gonna sell if we can get to 265 or if we drop down to 206. That stop will trigger a market order to go off and then it, it'll just fill for whatever it fills for if we get down to 206 or below. Okay, there's no commission on this trade, but there can be on other types of trades. Just remember, there are little handy reminders here with market orders, prices can change quickly in fast market conditions, resulting in execution prices that can be different from the quotes displayed at order entry. In other words, we're not guaranteed just because it says around 220 that we're gonna pay around 220. And with stop orders, there's no guarantee the execution price will be equal to or near the activation price. Okay, send that order off. And we have just planned for and entered an order to execute the plan on a trade using the market forecast tool. So for a lot of you, this is gonna be brand new. So in 45 minutes, we've gone from, I've never heard of this thing before to now I can recognize with precision a potential entry signal and execute on that. So if this is the first time you've ever seen this, it might be time to go to your paper money, practice it. I'm not saying that you should use market forecast tool in your trading, but it's just another tool out there that may be a part of an investor's toolbox, all right? Everybody, thanks for giving me your time today. We've accomplished everything that I set out to do. We were gonna discuss the construction of the market forecast tool, that's a check. We're gonna talk about the potential application, check. And we're gonna place a trade, check, check, check. Accomplished all three. If you're enjoying these webcasts, I do hope that you're subscribed to our Trader Talks channel, Trader Talks Schwab Coaching Webcast. Just find us on YouTube. You can follow your favorite webcast series and your favorite instructors very efficiently there. Also follow Lee and me on X at Lee Bowl CS at Cameron May CS. This is a great resource uh, that not everybody takes advantage of. Neither of these two things I've just proposed cost you anything. And it just lets, it lets you have a more interactive daily experience with your favorite instructors. All right, everybody, thanks for giving me your time today. I'm gonna set you loose. Go enjoy the rest of your uh, webcast for the day. I'll see you again next Tuesday for another discussion of getting started with technical analysis. Uh, between now and then, of course, I'm gonna be looking for you on, um, uh, on other webcasts and on X, but whenever I see you again, until that moment arrives, I wanna wish you the very best of luck. Happy trading, bye-bye.